why do you hate half of these people? Now, you might count and say, well, it's not quite half, but maybe you're on side um, Christian Kobes de May, Rob Bell, uh, Joe Biden. Maybe you're on side Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson against Christians. Maybe you're on side Trump against Biden. Maybe you're Biden against Trump. But generally speaking, people sort of sort out this way. I want to talk about Phila, um, Philia Nikia versus Philia Sophia, Philo Nikia. You can call it Philo Philia. I mean, it's Philo Nikia versus Philo Sophia, bounded versus centered set, culture, war, religion. There's something that happens in a conversation or argument where people who might have the most amazing level of degree of agreement descend into bitter disagreement that might temporarily or permanently rupture relationships that scale. What I mean by relationships that scale are relationships that bleed over into their friends and family. They basically tribe up. After Jordan Peterson had this conversation with Kathy Newman, and of course it's about 35 million views, I just looked at it, um, you know, she didn't really want to engage with him, and that's fine, but he understood both the fact that in some ways it was a victory that he had won. He dunked on her. And in another way, and he wanted to sort of say, okay, well, let's let's kind of talk through these things and um, leave as friends. In other words, let's keep the game on the court, but let's not war off the court. And if you listen to a lot of, I was just listening, listening to the Jordan Peterson, um, Lawrence Krauss conversation, and, you know, Peterson brought up a, an illustration that he would often bring up about being a good sport in that you're not looking to humiliate the, the sports adversary, you're looking to win. Um, so all of this stuff. So let's, let's dive into it a little bit. Part of the reason that I'm going to use Neil Shenvey and Christian and Kristen Dumay is because both have been both of them have been on my channel. Uh, Kristen teaches in the history department of my alma mater, the Christian Reformed Church, is a small little community. Um, and Neil Shenvey has, you know, I've had him on my channel, and I've had pleasant conversations with him and nice um, back and forths over Twitter. But so much of this stuff boils down into the Internet of Beefs. And if you've never read The Internet of Beefs by um, Venka, Venkatesh Rao, uh, you should definitely read it. The link will be down below. It basically talks about how the Internet gets us relating to each other in a particular way. Maybe I should read some quotes from it. Beefing is everywhere on the internet. Bernie and Warren beef with each other and with Trump. Different schools of economists beef with each other over trade policy. Climate hawks beef with climate doves. Um, here you see Slavoj Zizak and Jordan Peterson taking their beef offline. There you see Ben Shapiro attempt to bait um, AOC into a live beef for the hundredth time. And over on that side, we see Jesse Singal beefing with trans activists. And in one corner by himself, of course, Nassim Tlaib beefing with all comers on all topics. Hulk smash. Tlaib muddying the factional boundaries of the culture war is just one of few genuinely amusing theaters in the conflict in the internet of beefs. The blast, blast radius around his Twitter feed is not safe. Is not a safe space for anyone besides members of his own cult of Mesopotamian personality. The most important beefs, though, are not between celebrities at all, but among the anonymous masses who face off under their banners. Conflict in the Internet of Beefs is not governed by any sort of grand strategy or any particular, um, particularly governed by ideological doctrines. It's an unflattening, Hobbesian, unflattened Hobbesian honor society conflict with a feudal structure, at the heart of which is an involuntary, anonymous, fungible, angry figure desperate to be seen as significant, the MOOC. And then the MOOCs, of course, have around them their knights. And so I've read this before. It's it's an outstanding article. Should definitely be read by anybody who may you know if you if they're going to start handing out licenses to be on Twitter, you should basically pass a test um, showing that you've read this piece at least. Now, whenever I see this dynamic, I always think about bounded and centered set belonging because depending on, we're going to do some relevance realization here. Depending on 
what kinds of questions you ask, Neil Shenvey and Kristen, um, Kristen Dumay should be friends. They should be brother and sister in Christ. Kristen Dumay is a professor at Calvin University, which means she had to sign a uh, covenant. It's similar to the, the thing I have to sign in my denomination, covenant of office bearer, which says that she holds to certain doctrines and, um, and she can be called to account for those doctrines. Um, um, infallibility, infallibility of scripture or, or some, you know, at least high view of scripture. And I don't want to, I don't want to get too theological in this, um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, apostles creed, Nicene creed, Athanasian creed, um, Heidelberg catechism, Belgic confession, canons of Dort. Um, Neil Shenvey might not line up on all of those doctrinal matters, but on a good many of them, very much so. I've, I've said before in my video, Shenvey isn't a theologian. What, what he's basically doing with a lot of the stuff he's doing is code checking. He's a theoretical chemist, and so he's just sort of code checking what he sees out there in public domain as Christian theology and saying, well, are the words that I find in these books on critical theory and social justice, how do these match up with the words that I find in theological textbooks? Now, again, a theologian could go back and forth on this, but essentially what he's been doing is code checking. So in a number of respects, he and Kristen Kobe du, um, Kristen Kobes Dumay should be able to find huge alignment on all sorts of things. But if you go onto Twitter, um, they're the knights, and they have bands of mooks, and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth they go. And part of why this catches my interest are some of my colleagues are some of the mooks, and I just and friends, some of my friends are some of the mooks, and I just watch the the this battle go on and on and on, and I think this is a rather pointless thing, and I think. Part of what might help us understand and maybe even act better is some knowledge of what was written about in missiology in the 1970s by, a, by Paul Hybert um, in an article that he wrote about conversion, culture, cognitive categories, about bounded set and centered set believing in groups. Now, this was a pretty important thing that came up in missiology because you are always having to ask yourself the question, are we making any Christians here? And depending on your cultural categories, well, that might be kind of a difficult thing to figure out, especially if the cultural expressions of Christianity seem to be so radically different in the sending culture from the receiving culture. And we see this kind of thing all the time. Um, these kind of dynamics have been pointed out and poked fun at or derided, and especially quite popularly in, in the Poisonwood Bible, let's say. So, so this is an ongoing um, conversation, and it has to get into this question of how do you categorize people, events, and movements? So I actually made a whole video last week, and I tried using the whiteboard, and um, I so disliked the video that I've never posted it. I almost I was tempted to post, post it on my clip channel, which is sort of a video place for th things that are even so rough drafty that I don't dare put it on this channel. But I want to talk about bounded set and centered set. So let's imagine you have the question, um, Christian or not? You're going to look at things like behaviors and beliefs. And you're going to say, now are these Christian behaviors or not Christian behaviors? Are these Christian beliefs or not Christian beliefs? And one of the ways to think about these things are, again, center versus bounded set. Now, bounded set is fairly simple. A bounded set is basically a fence where you have posts. And the posts uh, might be things like, um, let's first talk about beliefs because we talk about them quite about. Let's say you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's say you believe in the incarnation, the divinity of Christ. Let's say you believe in the authority of the Bible. 
Um, and so let's say a person agrees with those things and so then they fall in there. Well, let's say maybe, let's look at behaviors. Um, attends worship at church. Um, let's say doesn't practice chicken sacrifice in their backyard or maybe doesn't have an altar in their home to their ancestors. Okay. Um, no altar to the ancestor, something like that. And so you basically look at this and you say, okay, on this basis, we can identify them as a Christian or not a Christian. Now, now what Christians call missions is all about well, these kinds of issues because, well, when Christendom was a little bit more solid, um, missionaries would leave their sending country and go to another country and try to convince people of a variety of things. But there'd always be some, some cultural issues that would sort of stand out. And so, well, let's say they believe, they said they believed in the resurrection, but who knows what their ideas of the resurrection were. They talked about the divinity of Christ, but maybe their ideas of divinity were very different from Western ideas of divinity. Um, they believed in the authority of the Bible, but they also believed in the authority of a whole bunch of proverbs that came down to them through their family. They would go to the Christian church for worship, but you never quite knew why are you coming here and what is their level of understanding or engagement. You don't just duplicate what you had in Europe or North America, um, in Africa or Asia or in the jungles of South America. And so there are all these questions and missionaries are dealing with it. And then, then for some reason, some something, there'd be a there'd be a sore thumb or something that would stand out. Let's say ancestor worship. In, in the Dominican Republic, in the Christian Reformed Church of the Dominican Republic, it was always fun because, of course, we're a Calvinist denomination. And, and so part of, the, part of the pastoral training was to try to hammer into um, pastors in the, in the Christian Reformed Church in the Dominican Republic, um, are you saved by faith or works? And the pastors would always say both. And I, I know already in the comment section, a lot of people will cheer, yay, and others will say no, and back and forth and back and forth. Now, the, the doctrinal statement of the Christian Reformed Church in the D Dominican Republic was just the Apostles' Creed. It was sort of a, here's a bare minimum thing. Now, in the Dominican Republic, in the Christian Reformed Church in the Dominican Republic, let's say one of the staves that they might have in their bounded set was that... Um, uh, men don't wear shorts in public, and women don't wear pants, and women who wear lipstick are painted ladies. Now, these were not ideas introduced to the uh, Haitian Dominicans by Christian Reformed missionaries in the latter part of the 20th century um, when they came there. These were some ideas that were introduced there in far by far earlier generations of missionaries, and they sort of stuck in the culture, and they sort of took on their own life in the culture, as many of these artifacts, beliefs, and behaviors do. And so to see them through North American eyes, and so then what, what I would sometimes watch the my colleagues try to do was sort of talk the national pastors out of their ideas about lipstick and women wearing pants and men wearing shorts, et cetera, et cetera, because none of the missionaries or the missionaries' wives cared about these things, but the nationals did. And so I would watch some missionaries just, you know, really lean onto this. And I thought, well, this is kind of silly because a hundred years ago, they leaned on them one way, and now coming from North America, they're leaning on them the other way. Why don't you give these poor people a break and just say, shorts, pants, who cares? Um, you're going to hassle your people? No, but this is, this is it's women's liberation that they get to wear pants. It's like, pants are more liberated than skirts? I don't know. They're, you know, as I'd watch, let's say, Haitian women navigating their skirts with the with the common difficulties of, let's say, relieving yourself in public, skirts were quite useful to them. They just sort of would stop someplace and 
kind of squat someplace and the skirt would be nicely around because there's no place to relieve yourself and there they'd take care of business. And so, well, there you have it. And of course, there were great, um, there were great divisions over whether or not breasts should be exposed and in other undeveloped parts of the world. And there's lots of missionary stories about this. And, of course, um, nursing children in church was a very common thing in the churches I would practice. And so, you know, here in North America, when nursing became vogue again, you know, you know, North American women would have a, a, you know, a towel very carefully. You know, these are modest missionary wives, a towel very carefully covering everything up and you know, you'd, you'd think that when the kid got to be three or four years old, the only way they'd know how to eat would be to throw a tablecloth over their head because <laughs> for the first three years of his life, the kid ate in the dark. But, you know, all these crazy, crazy things. So bounded set are all these beliefs and behaviors usually articulated in propositional fashion to sort of cement them on top. And those are bounded set ideas. And I've got a, a group of links on my blog about them that I'll put the link to that group of links in the notes. Now, center set, um, let's see, I'm still trying to figure out the best way to manage different notebooks on, or different whiteboards on um, this computer here, on two computers. Microsoft Whiteboard works pretty well, doesn't sync terribly fast. Okay, here we go. Let's talk about centered set. And yeah, um, never would win a handwriting comp contest. Let's see, center. Centered set. Well, well centered set was a way that Paul Hebert was talking about. And let's say your goal as a missionary was Christ. And then the question was, are they moving towards Christ or away from Christ? And let's say you're looking at an Islamic mission field and maybe the divinity of Christ or an embrace of the doctrine of the Trinity or, or some of these ideas would be difficult. But let's say that this person, they couldn't embrace all of those, all of those bounded set ideas. Well, that doesn't look very good. any of those bounded set ideas. And so basically, as a missionary, you would judge your effectiveness by saying, okay, is this person, maybe this person is now praying to Jesus. Maybe they're still going to the mosque and maybe they continue to identify with their Islamic community for family reasons. And uh, maybe it would be hazardous to them politically or in terms of their safety. So so now they're just starting to 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 believe in Jesus in limited ways. And this, this developed into a whole, whole different level of, um, whole different schema in terms of at what level is this person a Muslim and at level, what level is this person a Christian? And you might say, well, complete embrace of a whole bunch of bounded set ideas, the divinity of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, um, the, the work of the cross and atonement, et cetera, et cetera. That would be like the highest level, but maybe a low level would believe that, well, Jesus is a prophet, and this person is now sort of beginning to pray to Jesus. And because they're beginning to pray to Jesus, we think that they're actually making progress, and so we can evaluate our missionary effort and say, okay, we're, we're making progress here. Now, why am I talking about all this missiology with respect to these things? Because when it comes to when it comes to questions like why do you hate half the people on this list here, it has everything to do with what the missionaries were described describing in many ways. Certain people that I know and love are furious; they just can't really stand uh, Jesus and John Wayne, and they can't stand its author because she's moving the church in the wrong direction. In other words, there's a centered set nature to what's going on there. Now, what's also very interesting about this is that 
so much of this stuff is people focused. In other words, someone might not even care so much what Christian Kobes Dumay or let's take even a bigger name because that more people will know Jordan B. Peterson, nobody will even care so much what they think on many of their bounded set ideas. And, and this is a point that I would make to a lot of people who would be like, well, Jordan Peterson is a is a he's a he's a fascist and a Nazi and a right wing ideologue. And it's like, really? Really? Jordan Peterson is those things? Anybody who knows anything about the man's biography knows he isn't those things. Aha! But it's not bounded set issues that they are looking at. And most often when we look at people, we're not really thinking about bounded set issues. Because notice with the center set, what was the, what was the point of direction that they're looking at? Well, it was actually Christ. A person. And people have directionality and, and a dynamism that propositional statements never have. And so Jordan Peterson is, I mean, this is part of what caught my interest because here you had a, a Canadian psychologist who was teaching at University of Toronto and he was giving lectures on the Bible. And I thought, well, either he's some Canadian evangelical, of which there aren't that many, who is somehow made his peace. He's, he's sort of like the, the, the house Negro of conservatives at University of Toronto, something like that. They're, they're, they're sort of keeping him there as a token, maybe. Oh, so look, we're diverse. We have Jordan Peterson. He's evangelical. Nope, wasn't evangelical. You'd hear that right away and you start listening to him and start listening to his ideas of the Bible. That whole different idea of who he was. So then why did people hate him so much? Well, because people thought he is taking us in a direction. And that's where the, the centered set really comes into play because not only is Jordan Peterson taking us in a direction, what there basically is in the culture is, well, I'll use a blue pen because we have colors here, is there's this idea of flow. And it's the idea that Jordan Peterson... Why did I why did I do that? Why did I do that to the J? I don't know why I thought that, you know, drawing would be a good idea. I always like drawing because drawing has a certain dynamism to it. That's why I do it in my Sunday school class. Jordan Peterson is taking the world in the wrong direction. Now, let's see. I'm, I'm dyslexic, so I'm always left to right. I can't keep these things. Anyway. Let's, because we read left to right, I'm going to turn the direction around because people would say, well, Jordan Peterson is, is, is not on the right side of history and he's taking us in the wrong direction. And how do they think of that? Well, usually it's because they sort of have this implicit bounded set that is operating in their mind and here's a set over here. Let's call, let's call it maybe same-sex marriage. Or, um, no, let's pick a one that's actually more apt to it. Let's see the, let's say the structure of the gender binary. All right. So the idea is that the, see, now I got my directions all messed up. You know, it's probably stuff. Oh, shoot. Is this not moving up into the other screen? Uh, oh, oh, look, I can do this. I didn't know I could do that. Okay, good. Um, it's saved. I mean, this, it's kind of stuff like this that scotched the last video, and I really hate to spend an hour or so making this video and only to only to stick it in the can. Okay, so the idea is that Jordan Peters, Jordan B. Peterson, in a centered set way, is bringing people backwards because what we really need to be doing, so a group of people say, is to get rid of the gender binary. Okay, and so Jordan B. Peterson is going against the flow. And again, this flow in terms of a cultural imaginary is really huge. Because when it comes to, let's say, let's go and let's make, maybe make a, um, we'll make a little Neil Shenvey and we'll put him here. And let's maybe we'll say here's, 
and she's there, but she's going this way because she might be looking at this and saying, oh, what the Christian Reformed Church needs to do, and she was tweeting about this, so I'm not, you know, this is why you use public people because they they let their positions be known in public, and so she was saying, well, you know, the Christian Reformed Church should embrace same-sex marriage. In a sense, what she's looking to do, and this is why centered set and bounded set are always living at the same time in a dynamical system. Ooh, let me try this other new tool. What she's trying to do is move the Christian Reformed Church. Oh, I like that action. Oh, I like this. Move the Christian Reformed Church so that same-sex marriage is a part of its bounded set. Now, of course, let's see if I can move this. Oh, look at this. The idea, especially if a, now we talk about progressivism, the idea is that same-sex marriage and, let's see, can I move this? Oh, I can move it here this way too. Good. The idea is that same-sex marriage and destroying the gender binary are all parts of the continuing flow that things are going to keep going this way. And good old evil George Peter Jordan Peterson, <laughs> George Peterson, Jordan Peterson and Neil Shenvey, they're on the wrong side of history, even though in a bounded set situation. They would agree very much. I mean, Neil Shenvey and Kristen Kobes Demay, in in some respects, share much more with each other in terms of beliefs about religious things than they do with, let's say, Jordan B. Peterson. But they find themselves on the different side of history, flow, the different side of what. And it's that what that I think we really need to pay attention to. Because really, that's where all of this religious stuff begins to happen. Now, what often happens with a lot of this... Ooh, I can shrink it. Did it shrink here too? No, no. Okay, good. It's, this, is, this is me learning to use a whiteboard in real time. Isn't it exciting? So part of... So in my conversations at Christian Forum Church, for example, with respect to questions about... Same sex, maybe should um, label this here, C-R-C-N-A. That's sort of the bounded set and the center set that are working together. My question always with the people who want to, let's say, move the corral is, okay, so you want to move the corral. It used to be here, and now it's down here. Um, where are we going? And... What you'll usually find with people that are over here, eh, they don't want to get too specific about that. Or they'll say things like, well, once we do the same-sex marriage thing, then, that, then we'll stop there. And I'll say, well, what about the gender binary? Well, well, that's not such a big deal. Maybe we can sort of bring that in over there too. And I'll say, well, once both of those things are, are in, you know, what else is floating here in this river? And one of the things I'll usually mention, which will make everybody, well, at least those people upset, I'll, I will say, how about um, policing authentic sexuality in whatever form someone decides is authentic to them? Oh, well, that doesn't sound so bad. And then I'll bring up the uncomfortable point that, for the most part, nobody gets disciplined formally in the Christian Reformed Church anymore except pastors. And, and then I'll just tell some story, which is very easy to tell because there's usually a handful of them every year of some minister in the Christian Reformed Church who has an affair or decides that their soulmate is not the person that they're married to or maybe decides that their, their um, sexual orientation is not the one that, um, that they embraced when they married an opposite-sex opposite sex spouse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then the game is afoot. But my point here is not to, again, have a have a, a big discussion about same-sex marriage or the CRC or the gender binary, any of this, but to notice the flow, to notice how these conversations work and that these conversations take up a life of their own and that for the most part, 
these conversations seldom serve us well. Because if we really want to talk about some change that maybe should happen, and let me be clear about flow. Um, flow actually goes in both directions at once. We're seldom just going off into the future. I remember things that in the 70s were um, not a big deal that progressives now look at and say, oh no, this is prohibited. Like, oh, I thought we were liberating people. Oh, but in order to liberate some things, we must clamp down on other things. And you begin to realize that in some ways, there's sort of a zero-sum game going about with many of these things. And so that's that's part of the reason that I'm a um, – when I talk in these conversations and when I ha try to have these conversations and try to do them productively, if people are positing sort of a flow, you sort of ask, well, where is this flow going? And what is, in fact, governing this flow? Because if, in fact, you sort of have a progressive ethos like this, what you really have at some point is a telos. And if you're not pursuing a telos, what you're probably doing is you're reacting against, then ba basically you have a parasitic or a reactive frame that you're working from. And if you're actually working from a parasitic or reactive frame, you're going to find yourself in a lot of trouble because parasitic and reactive frames never can, as Jonathan Peugeot mentioned, actually build something that's stable because they're just always reacting against. We're, we're against what they're for. Well, that actually leaves them in charge. And if you actually want to have a stable, productive community, you're going to need to be for some things on your own, no matter how others disagree. But again, the main point of this is now this flow that takes over, this flow between centered set and bounded set, you know, philia nikia, and we get ourselves all excited about a fight and we want to win the fight on Twitter and the mooks and nunstein nucks. The mooks and knights dynamic takes over, and again, I find friends and colleagues squabbling, and I think, is this really what we should be doing? Is this squabble actually productive? And the biggest thing is usually, you know, I, my, I haven't talked a lot about Jesus and John Wayne and my thoughts of the book, but... I'll just ask this question. Who is that book for? I think the book is sort of for the convinced. Let's flip the script. Let's look at a Trump rally. Who is a Trump rally for? Trump rallies were for the convinced. Because if, let's say, you actually want to move... Oh, let's get rid of this here. Let's say you actually want to move the CRCNA from one position to another. That's my denomination. If you want to move the CRCNA from one denominate from one position to another, you're probably going to have to convince people. And generally speaking, telling people that they're, and then you can list all sorts of moral defects that you find in them or suspect you find in them, trying to convince them, trying to change their mind will probably not be done by being obnoxious or offensive or basically saying that they're reprobate or behind the times or on the wrong side of history or any other any other types of, of, of situation. A couple of days ago on Twitter, this came out. Scott Cauley, um, a mutual friend of ours, wanted us to talk. And, it, you know, me having internet conversations, it, half of the time they fall through. And that's okay. I usually figure I don't, I don't try too hard with a lot of people because I always figure when the time is right, the time is right. But someone directed me to this. Now, he, you know, status is important if these things. Let's see. He's got 16,000, almost 17,000 followers on Twitter. He's... 
philosopher working on metaethics, social and political philosophy, um, views expressed are my own. Um, basically, uh, about a, a 5K Twitter, someone with a 5K Twitter account that is usually sort of progressive evangelical. And here, I, I see we're talking about David and Bathsheba again. I, I didn't see that myself. Some thoughts. Uh, either Bathsheba was raped or she committed adultery. There's no gray area. Um, if you say that she wasn't raped, you are saying that she committed adultery. And then goes on quite a few tweets and a thread to state the case. And at the bottom of it, I said, basically, bit of a cold case, 3,000 years or so. And then he says, indeed, it's a bit of a Rorschach test for one's view of women and women's responsibilities for men's sins. Sadly, a whole lot of conservative evangelical men are failing the test. I troll on Twitter. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to make a bigger deal of this than it is, but... There is a spirit here that I certainly have participated in the past that that I probably need to repent of and turn away from in increasing measure, but but to try to do so in a way that hopefully, I don't know, is helpful to the overall conversation, that we're just sort of being what what I mean in in school days we'd be tattletales to whom in this? That there are Conservative evangelical men out there, you know, I wouldn't have been surprised if he'd said white conservative evangelical men out there, even though I've know, known a lot of brown conservative and black conservative evangelical men out there that would fail his test of, test of what? And, and so these flows develop, these dynamics develop, and, and very quickly we're just, we're raging over things that, is this fight actually going to produce anything except sort of an accounting in the popular imaginary of who's sitting in what seat in the arena, who's on the right side of history, who's on the wrong side of history? And again, back and forth and parallel too. Uh, yesterday or so, or a couple days ago, I saw that um, Rebel Wisdom had a video with Megan Dom and... Um, I've listened to Megan Dom talk to uh, Glenn Lowry. Um, she's she has some interest. I uh, I don't know. She's kind of an East Coaster. She at least feels that way. So, of course, th I feel a degree of affinity. And I thought it was an outstanding conversation. And I thought it was terrific. Both of them talking about sort of their journeys through this IDW space, which you know I'm. I'm very much sort of a part of that space because in terms of the Christian Reformed Church, I was always sort of on the left and I sort of felt that the left left me behind and, you know, I used to be on the left and now I'm the bad guy with Jordan Peterson and and Megan Dom and David Fuller and I'm, I'm a bad guy because I didn't keep progressing, didn't keep swimming with the stream as fast as everybody else swam with the stream. And... You know, they talked about a whole bunch of different things, and I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Dom thought that the reason that the a big part of the reason that people sort of tribe up is loneliness. And I think that's certainly a factor. I'm not sure that's the only variable in this. I think that's a variable. I think there's a whole lot more. I, I tend to think that, as many have noted, it's sort of a, a really cheap way to gain moral status. If, if you can be on Twitter saying all the right things, then somehow you can become, maybe you can become a knight. First, you're a faithful nuke and then mook, and then you become a knight and, and off you go. I think a lot of this is pro felicity. It's, it's us seeing ourselves on the screens in sort of matching up with our moral heroes. If, if the if certain clips of certain people have become sort of religious icons in your world, even if you have a very shallow association with them, you want to be on the screen lining up with these other moral icons, saying what everybody else in that little tribe is saying, and then we devolve into the internet of beefs and we're picking at each other, and pretty quickly the flow starts and it's Philea Nikia all over the place, even though... Again, I find 
I find none of it means hardly anything. You know, when when the George Floyd stuff was going down and suddenly, and you find these dynamics, you find it in the French Revolution, you find it in almost any revolution, very quickly, you got to be on one side or the other. It's sort of, it's sort of tribal warfare, modern tribal warfare. You got to be on one side or the other. And if you break ranks, we're going to get you because we're going to get you worse than the enemy because the only thing we hate worse than the enemy is a traitor. But I find all of this posturing and positioning and I'm very seldom convinced that most of the people who are posturing or 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 showing themselves showing up uh, representing etc cetera, etc cetera, are ever actually going to do anything for what they imagine they are representing at all it becomes a silly language game you know for all of the for all of the concern about people of color Piling on Neil Shenvey and Glenn Lowry hardly <laughs> continues the narrative that their perhaps their you know standpoint epistemology about being an African American or an Indian immigrant you know should somehow give them status. But no, and that's why I sort of scoff at the whole thing because it's simply political confessionalism. It doesn't matter what color you are when you're making the point. The point is the point, and that you show up on the right side of the flow. Part of where this conversation went, which delighted me, was Megan Dom was saying, well, we've sort of started doing conversations off camera about important things because when you turn off the recording and if you don't post it on the internet, people will say what they really think. Now, there's kind of a two-sidedness to that because in another way, the internet facilitates people saying what they really think, often for ill. <laughs> but that's the whole business between whether or not we should have anonymity on the internet. And th this whole conversation is tremendously complex, actually, in terms of when people will show up and say the right thing. And when they were talking about community, I thought, you know, this is the stuff you live in in a church all the time. And again, I've said before, this is part of the reason that the estuary idea, I think, is so powerful is because, well, I've always had it as a practice in my church that you shouldn't lose status in the church for sharing what you believe. At the same time, you will lose status in church for sharing what you believe because the, the church actually has a degree of valence. And so then you have, again, all the insider, outsider, believing versus belonging, bounded set versus centered set, this entire dynamic. And in fact, in the church, we have a huge amount of experience navigating these things because we're practicing them all the time. It doesn't mean that we necessarily are doing better, but at least we have an idea about just how complex all of this group making is. And often when I listen to these conversations, it's like well, we're going to rebuild the institutions that we have thrown away decades ago. Because, of course, churches weren't the only organizations. You had your local rotary. Um, you had these do-gooding societies. I mean, it's all of the stuff that um, Robert Putnam wrote about with Bowling Alone. The loss of all these sort of middle, these middle groupings that, that really made the American social, political, and religious environment so dynamic. And it's really that loss of the middle groupings that, that we are suffering from. Because what we really need, as the free speech ad, um, advocates note, what we really need is for us to be able to have productive conversations about the kinds of things that we really need to talk about. And we should find ways to retard these flow dynamics. And, and really, in many ways, the, the only way to retard the flow dynamics are, is actually to create groups and networks of thick dependency, things that you can't walk away from very easily. And this is part of the inherent weakness of the Internet. 
because if there's anything that the internet facilitates, and not just the internet, but you know, the rise of the nanny state, and I can say that in different ways, because basically what the state, I'm getting this from Yuval Harari, hardly a reactionary, that one of the one of the things that the state facilitated was individualism. I no longer need my children to survive into old age, so I'd better work hard on maintaining good relationships with my children. And I'd better treat them well when they're weak and dependent, so that when I am in old age, weak and dependent, they will treat me the way I treated them, with generosity and loving kindness and long suffering. Because for most of us, we're only a child for, depending on what level of childhood we're talking about, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, we could be an old person for a very long time. So there's a lot going on here, but I, I think where they ended up in that, we do need communities. And we need communities where we have differences. And again, this has been a tremendous failing of churches over time in that not just theological differences, but right now in the United States, churches sort of polarizing along political differences. And I get heat from the right and the left with my determination of keeping church in many ways a safe space politically. And I'm very proud of the fact that the whole time, I can't take credit for it because the church here is as old as I am and I inherited a lot when I got here. I've got people who voted for Trump in my church. I've got people who voted for Biden in my church. And you know what? They're all part of a very small church and they look across the they look across the table and they learn to love each other. And the fact that things have gotten so polarized so that families are being split up and marriages are being split up. That's a bad sign. Also in the New York Times today, there was an interesting article, Marriage Requires Amnesia. Do I hate my husband? Oh, for sure, yes, definitely. And on my blog when I posted it, hating the spouse that you love. That's the way these things work. And what we really need to do is get our reps, sort of a training analogy, getting your reps, getting your reps in at loving your enemy. How do you get your reps in at loving your enemy? by being in thick relationships of dependency with people with whom you differ. And I don't mean, oh, they just like to wear blue instead of green. No, I mean, they're your enemy. They're your adversary. They're annoying you. They're doing things that you think are not only on the wrong side of history, but keeping history from coming. And I think about Jesus in this because, again, in the Judean culture war in the first century, well, on one side of it, you know, the problem in the world are Roman occupational troops in Judea, right there next to the temple in the Antonia Fortress, overlooking the temple. They're the problem. Others would say, no, the problem are those recalcitrant Jews that clearly don't see that the way of the future is, is Romanish Hellenism. That's so obvious. Look at who rules the world. Jerusalem doesn't world, rule the world. Rome rules the world. So get with the program. Keep up with the times. Build your hippodrome. Go naked to the gymnasium and say, Caesar is Lord. These things don't end. We just fight about different things. So take a step back. Look at the dynamic and use a little bit of that impressive cognitive ability you have that says, if you really think the opposition is thinking in a wrong way, how can I talk to them in a productive way that maybe both lowers the polarity and, for my own mercenary sake, maybe even woos them over to my side? Calling them a redneck or a bigot isn't going to help your cause if you actually want to influence rather than dunk on or dominate your neighbor. And if you're going to grow in this capacity, get in more reps at loving your neighbor. How do you do that? Marriage is good at it. Try and avoid divorce. Because divorce is sort of the epitome of cutting and running. 
And it's usually cutting and running that costs you and your spouse, and especially your children if you have any, a lot. Try not to get divorced. Maybe you hate your spouse. Learn to love them even while you're hating them and vice versa. The church is actually good at this because the church has long navigated tensions between Satanic Peter and Rock Peter. Who's Satanic Peter? Jesus says, oh, Peter, we're going down to Jerusalem. Oh, oh, that's a bad idea, Jesus. We're going to go down to Jerusalem and your worst fears are going to be realized. I'm going to be turned over into the hands of Gentiles and crucified. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to rise from the dead. That they didn't hear at all. And they and Peter says, I'm never going to let those grimy Gentiles get their hands on you, Jesus. Jesus could have said, well, that's very loyal of you, Peter, and I really appreciate the sentiment. No, Jesus is a little hyperbolic. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have the ideas of God. You have the ideas of the rest of this tribal fight that you're all flowing down to destruction into. Not too much later, he'll say, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Peter, in very few chapters, goes from Satan to the foundation of the church. Churches practice this stuff, often poorly, but church is a place you can practice this. You practice the dance of hate and love at the same time. And hopefully as you learn to dance, you learn to do it in a productive way. You need more ties that bind in order to disagree productively, to not demonize your conversation partner. Hold back from the dunk if you can. Resist the dunk. Now, I just posted this and a little bit of this on Twitter, but I thought this was so well said. And if IDW 2.0 can look more like this, bring it on. Hello. So you talked about about um, how your view on relationships has changed. And since you talked at the union three years ago, how have your other opinions changed and why? Well, one thing that's changed, most of this is a deepening, I would say, rather than a transformation of beliefs. Um, but it's a deepening and a specification of things that I more dimly apprehended before. One of the things I've really learned more explicitly, I would say in the last six months, is to not win. I knew this already like in my clinical practice. Now, I want to say a little bit about not winning. And he's going to qualify it, and that's absolutely fair because there's, I know, nuance has become a bad word. All right, what other words are we going to throw out? Justice, nuance. Part of where the Christian faith helps you is because, and not just any Christian faith, but a Christian faith that believes in an agentic God who is sovereign, controls history, and rules the world in that the Son of God can be crucified and you're still going to win. What do you mean you're still going to win? Well, again, Jesus, after he's risen from the dead, doesn't go and appear to Pontius Pilate and say, how do you like me now, you corrupt piece of Roman trash? Jesus doesn't do that. Not winning in the short term is facilitated by a belief that in the end, God will have his way. And he's a good God. And we are going to be blessed by it. And so actually holding off on not winning is part of how you actually participate in the coming Philia Sophia, the coming victory. I never, tr I tried my best not to be right. You know, so for example, as a clinician, you can dispense. And, and that's not terribly accurate. I tried my best basically not to be self-righteous, we might say. That's advice, and so it, it'd be quite easy, if, especially if I wasn't suffering at that time while well, practicing as a clinician, and the person was, I think, well, you know, I've got my life together pretty well, and I'll just tell you what 
you should do. And sometimes people would ask for that, right? But it's not that helpful because, well, what the hell do you know about what they should do? In fact, telling them what they should do isn't not only helpful, but if you've got a real Philea Nikia flow going, it's absolutely poisonous. You know, you can introduce topics of conversation like, well, most people have friends and you don't seem to have any. And, you know, maybe you have a reason for that. And maybe it's a, you know, fundamentally valid reason. And that's not where your interests are oriented. Maybe you're particularly introverted, which doesn't mean you don't need friends. But that's way different than saying, well, here's what you should do. And the problem with here's what you should do is, first of all, as the psychoanalysts knew, you just set up resistances in people. And the reason, so they won't do it even if they want your advice, and often they'll do the opposite, just out of spite, and probably they should. Be and once you have a Philea Nikia flow going, that's exactly the dynamic you set up. Because they're basically saying, up yours. It's like, this is my life, man, not yours. And the other problem with advice is, well, let's say you go, you take my advice, and then you go do something good. It's like, well, whose victory is that? Is it yours or mine? So uh, did I just steal your victory? Well, that's not so good. And so it's wonderful when we can win together. I know it sounds sappy, but it's true. That's what you want in a marriage. You want a win-win. I learned that pretty thoroughly as a clinician not to do that, and hopefully as a husband and father also not to do that. But in my talks with people like Sam Harris, I was more instrumental than I should have been. There were points I was trying to make, you know, and I was trying to be right. And... You know, there's, there's times for that, and there's partisan situations where only one side can win and another side has to lose, and election is like that. But I've really learned, I, I hope. And if you can keep those games, like elections, if you can keep them limited, which is, reason, which is the reason why you don't want a dictatorship, why you do want two parties with opposing views, so you actually trade. You know, power changing hands in a country is a feature, not a bug. In the last six or seven months to, to not do that, not to do that. And so the last conversation I had with Sam Harris, which was two weeks ago, which will be released in a relatively short order, was by Still waiting for it. I'm looking forward to that one. By far the best conversation we ever had. And I'm really looking forward to that one. All I did was ask him questions. And that wasn't manipulative. It wasn't like, well, I'm gonna, you know, and no one has, here in the audience has done this yet, but lots of times people ask me questions. They're not questions. They're disguised criticisms or they're statements of belief or they're an observation that perhaps if my Christian beliefs, for example, were more fully differentiated, I accepted Christ as my savior, that that would be a good thing. That comes up quite often. And they're not questions. Like a question is, question is something you want the answer to. Like, actually, you, you know, you want to know what the person thinks. And so all I did was ask Harris questions. And I learned all sorts of things about the way he thought that I didn't know and about commonalities in our approach to problems that I didn't understand. And the conversation was much more enjoyable. I mean, the give and take of our previously more tendentious conversations had an, uh, what would you say? There was an element of sort of combative enjoyment to them. So they weren't nothing, and they were reasonably successful as public spectacles and, I suppose, as philosophical investigations. But this was way better, way better. And I understood what motivated Sam way more than I did before. And, and I've been doing a lot of, I hope, political peacemaking between Democrats and Republicans in the U.S. because that better happen. And, you know, I've, I've managed on the moderate Democrat side to con convince, convince, to learn along with a variety of moderate Democrats that even when dealing with their, you know, the people across the aisle, that winning is not a good strategy, or maybe it's better than losing. Let's say it's not an optimal strategy, right? That's a better way of thinking about it. There are, and if you're trying to win a conversation, that might be better than losing, you know? But it's not as good as mutual self elevate mutual elevation in the progression of the discourse we're trying to figure out language for this we haven't sort of memified it we haven't we haven't got it logos hasn't quite come down and given us exactly the right words of what we're talking about here so 
the the philia the, the philia nikia flow or the philia sophia flow um you know this is basically what we're looking for that's way better that's a real victory and so i hope that i've learned that you know more deeply and that i can take that to heart more deeply and then i can govern my actions i have conversations that are very tense with people well i always have and that certainly hasn't stopped and i have to tread very carefully and any instrumentalism on my part you know because one of the things you want to do when you win is dominate in, in some sense right and that's a cheap victory i would say it's better than losing perhaps you know because sometimes you can retreat and let the other person have the floor let's say but it's not the optimal solution not at all and man you you just you just have no idea how far you can get with people if if what you do is ask them questions because you're interested in what they think and it's so damn useful for them because then in the discourse they reveal elements of themselves that they really didn't know and what's also interesting i've seen people do this i had a striking example of that within my own family where one of my family members was had a grudge against another and uh we waited it out instead of confronting it directly and the person with the grudge laid out why they had the grudge and it was so it was a character description of the person they were angry with and it was it was so unlike the person that well the person who had the grudge was revealing the story they realized that this was some fantasy they'd concocted like 15 years previously and pretty much abandoned it right after the utterance and so that happens frequently you know if you really disagree with someone first of all that's interesting because you're wrong and stupid and if they really disagree with you they might know something that you really need to know right rather than talking to someone that already agrees with you i mean that's hard because there's still points of conflict but it's worth digging for that if you can find it and then there's also the possibility that many of the differences are purely misunderstandings that's very frequently the case and then there's also the possibility that well the person engages in this dialogue well first of all they're happy about you because you're listening and people love that man they love that more than you listen to people you really listen to them instead of thinking about what you're going to say next or trying to win now now this is one of these against such things there is no law you know that's that's what when the apostle paul talks in the book of galatians about the fruit of the spirit he says that, and, you know, I've thought about that, and, and it continues to intrigue me because, in a sense, it's this kind of thing that is enormously powerful in this world. It is, it is, it, it is, the, it is the joint attention power of love against which this world has no weapon. Do you want to be powerful? Do you want to be a monster in all the right ways? Find those things, those kinds of things against which there is no law. And in fact, when in some really twisted societies they make laws against them, those laws always fall. Listen to someone well. Love them. Learn of them. Think of, think of the world's greatest tyrants. Even they don't oppose these things. Look at, look at murderous psychopaths who want to control and, and, and make the world their little plaything. They don't oppose such things. Against these things, there is no law. Major in those. You'll have so many people around you so soon that you won't even be able to stand it. So that's really something, man, to do that. And so... That's a pathway to peace, that listening, that's for sure. And it's a path, pathway to wisdom because if you listen to people, then they tell you all sorts of things you don't know. And that's true of people, no matter their position in society, man. I mean, you, and that's another thing I learned in my clinical practice. If I was bored by my client, I was doing it wrong. Because if I really listened to them, they were not boring, man. They were so damn interesting, you could hardly even stand to be in the same room. So, and I think that's true. And you know that's true. You know, you break through that facade, that, that persona, because you're having a genuine interaction. And it becomes as richly meaningful as listening to a symphony or something like that. And you remember that, you know. Look, he's almost breaking down. Because 
it's it's he's speaking the truth and it's touching him deeply and he's just in his mind he's he it brought him back to certain places of 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 real power of transformation that's that's when you break down when you feel that there's soul to soul contact in that and there is and that that's what that's what brings peace to the world that's what revitalizes everyone right and so so i hope i learned that more deeply and we'll see may this be idw 2.0 more philia more philia sophia and less philia nikia flow anyway there's the video i am going to post this one the other one failed this one was better so let me know what you think.